welcome to the Zoological Society of London and thank you, thank you very much uh, for joining us today for uh, the UCL Lunch Hour Talks. Um, so it's, um, I'm Natalie Petrelli. Uh, I work at the Zoological Society of London uh, in the Institute, which is the research department of the society. And it's uh, my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce the two speakers today, uh, primarily because I know them since I actually put my first foot in the UK. Um, so they were both working at the society when I joined in 2006 and then deserted and left us and went straight into UCL. But the good thing is that we have events like this so that we can bring them back and catch up uh, and have a laugh about all the things we used to do that we don't do anymore, of course. <laughs> um, so um, two speakers, uh, Dr. Sarian Sumner, uh, who is a reader in uh, behavioral ecology, and Professor Kay, Joan, uh, Kay Jones, uh, outstanding professor at UCL, but also doing some really cool work in conservation. So the first speaker, um, Sarian, um, works, as you might see from, uh, from uh, the title of a talk, on the WASP. Uh, she is absolutely uh, in love with insects. Uh, she has been uh, trying to get me into loving them for years um, uh, because we work together um, on subbox science. So Sarian's work uh, um, is primarily, or at least when I, when I started to chat with her about her work, was about behavioral ecology, so trying to understand what underpins sociality from a behavioral point of view, and looking at that uh, in WASP, just because WASP are those amazing uh, set of species that have very different type of um, social levels, which allow you to, to test a number of hypotheses as to what actually drives them to be more or less social. And she has uh, expanded the scope of her research to go from behavioral ecology, traditional behavioral ecology, with the boots in the, and, um, and uh, actually spending hours looking at them, go into more uh, genomic analysis. Uh, and then uh, for uh, quite a lot, looking at a lot of WASP all over the tropics, primarily. So um, she has had a number of uh, successes, uh, both in science, but also in science communication. And she will tell you more about this right now, but um, please welcome uh, Sarian. Thank you very much, Natalie. It's a really kind um, introduction. Now, I do like to use my floor, so I'm just clearing my dance space. Um, before I commence. So it's a great pleasure to be here um, today. I spent 10 years um, working next door in the Institute of Zoology. Um, so it's incredibly nostalgic coming back to ZSL to talk about my, my work. Um, so yes, so I am on a personal mission to um, challenge the public's perception of wasps. So they are, I do believe that they are the neglected darlings of the insect world. And so I hope that in the course of the next half hour, I will be able to persuade you guys that you should, well, at least if you, if you actually, let's have a show of hands. Who likes wasps? Oh, you're a really biased audience. <laughs> okay, so for those of you who dislike wasps, I hope that by the end of this talk, I might at least have given you a little bit of persuasion that they are at least useful. And so therefore, you may not love wasps by the end, but at least you might respect them a little bit more. Okay, so one of the reasons why wasps are so disliked is, of course, this, the sting. Hands up who's been stung by a wasp. Yes, everyone's been stung by a wasp. It's great fun. Um, so wasps are unlike... Um, so, so actually, it's, it's a common myth that bees, when they sting you, it's terribly self-sacrificing, and it rips out their innards, and the sting is left in you, and you don't mind being stung by them because... They're, you know, they've killed themselves to defend their colony. But actually, it's only honeybees that die when they sting you. So it's only that one species of bee that does that. All the other bees do exactly the same things as wasps. They can keep on stinging you, okay? So just remember that. So there are bees are not necessarily kinder and more self-sacrificing than wasps are. And it might soften the blow a bit to know that these stings in, in, in wasps were actually um, originally are part of the egg-laying machinery of the insect. And so in another, uh, in a re related group, the parasitoid wasps, these have modified that sting into a big, long egg-laying shaft called the ovipositor. You can impress your friends at home with that word. So it's basically a modified egg-laying machine, but they use it to defend themselves. But because of this, it has 
got this, this reputation of being the most disliked, pointless, annoying insect or animal, perhaps the uh, organism on the entire planet. And you only have to look to the internet for recognition of this, um, for affirmation of this. Um, so if you um, Google wasps, um, it's not long before you come up with some delightful images that, that conjure up this thought that wasps really are the gangsters of the insect world. They're the thugs. They are worth nothing. They're just there to cause us pain and anguish. And indeed, they've inspired many a horror movie. Um, and my personal favorite is The Wasp Woman, uh, which is a lovely uh, 1960s B movie. Um, where the female, that this, this woman, is jilted by her boyfriend and uh, to get revenge she starts to take this wasp venom that makes her look ever more beautiful. Um, but she takes too much of it and she becomes a wasp by night. So, she, so by day she's a beautiful, submissive woman, but at night she's a, a fearsome wasp woman and she devours uh, men. I believe that's a pile of bones that she's standing on there. So that's a really fun movie. I do recommend you have a look at it. But as you can see, wasps have inspired all sorts of crazy but gruesome parts of our popular culture. Now, I am, like many of the people in this room probably, fond of using social media. Um, and so recently, I did a little poll of my social media followers on Facebook and on Twitter to find out, really, if this truly was the, the, the perception that the public do have of wasps. Um, and this might be a bit biased because obviously we know that we live in these social media bubbles. We all learned about that through Brexit. Um, but this is a wordle which summarizes how my followers, my social media interactants, think or describe a wasp. So I asked them to all give me a word that they would use to describe wasps. The larger the word, this is a quantitative scientific representation of the data, the larger the word, um, the more people use that word to describe wasps. So they're an annoying, they're persistent, they're stingy, they're stripy, they're horrible, they're scary. But there's obviously a few friends in there because they also say that they're fascinating, <laughs> intriguing, and uh, beautif beautiful. Um, so, but I think this is a pretty good uh, perception, uh, representation of what the public, of what you guys um, think about uh, wasps. But I'm here today to try and reorganize those words and take away the nasty ones and put some really informative, useful words which are backed by the science to convince you that wasps are, in fact, important, useful, and should be much more adored. OK, so there's four key words I want you to take home with you today about wasps. Wasps are diverse, sophisticated, phenomenal and they are essential. So I'm going to take you on a little journey now to give you some evidence for why those wasps should be used to describe uh, uh, wasps. Okay, so first of all, they are incredibly diverse. And you're sitting there thinking, what is she talking about? A wasp is a wasp. It's this thing here. It's the yellow jacket. It's the yellow thing that gets in my beer in the summer and ruins our family picnics. Um, or it's the hornet, you know, that really big, scary thing that's going to come and invade the entire country. Well, actually, that's not true. This is just one very small, um, uh, few number of species um, of the wasps. They are, they are the most social wasps. They are the most impressive colonies with the largest numbers. And so that's probably why you notice them more. But it might surprise you. This is my equation. This is a science talk. This is the only equation you need to take home with you. It might surprise you to know that the number of wasp species, the number of species of wasps, vastly outweighs the number of bees and ants. OK, bit of audience participation time. Who would like to hazard a guess on how many species of ants there are? Give it a go. 8,000. Any advance on 1,000? 15, Kate, Kate knows too much. <laughs> there are actually 11,000, Professor Jones. There are 11,000 species of ants that, that are described. Um, how many species of bees are there? Two. <laughs> Pardon? 1,000? 2,000. 2, Any advance on 2,000? 
There are 22,000 species of bees. So isn't that incredible? Who knew that there were so many bees and so many wasps? Aren't they amazing? Yeah, but how many species of wasps? Go on, tell me. Any advance on 33,000? Try doubling it. And a bit more. 150,000 species of descri described species of wasps. There's probably uh, several um, thousand or 100,000 more undescribed species of wasps. The wasps are incredibly diverse, much more so than the bees and the ants put together. Okay, so just to really test your understanding of wasps, we're going to play a little game. Uh, it's called Wasp or Not. And what you have to do is to shout out, Wasp or Not! So should we have a go? Let's wasp first. One, two, three. Wasp. And not. excellent. Right. And as I show you a slide, I want you to shout wasp or not. And don't, don't worry about the people around you. Okay? This is about you. Be confident. Okay. Wasp. This is a tropical hornet. It is a wasp sitting on a wasp nest, which is not its nest. It's eating the nest of another wasp. Can we dim the light slightly? Yeah, this is the largest wasp in the world. It's the giant Asian hornet. It's seven centimetres uh, long. Um, it can fly 60 miles an hour. Yeah, and if you get stung by it, it's got uh, nine different types of venom. You are quite likely to die, okay? Do you think your yellow jacket's a problem at the picnics? This guy, whew, you don't want to go near them. Who said not? What is it? It's fuzzy, it's a bee. Well, actually, wasps can be quite hairy, too. Any advance on a bee? It's not a bee, it's not a wasp. It's a moth, exactly. It's mimicking a wasp. Isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? Um, what's this? Uh, so, obviously, this is a spider. <laughs> but I was, I was talking about this one. What's this? It is a wasp. Yes, it's a digger wasp. It's a solitary wasp. You get these in the UK. Um, they are um, pompylids, spider-eating wasps, and you can tell a spider-eating wasp because it has really curly antennae. They're really very beautiful, but again, they have a whopping sting because they have to paralyze big things like that. What about these? So, so is, is this a wasp? This is a parasitoid wasp. It is a wasp. It's not a stinging wasp. It's the one with the ovipositor that has that long uh, tube to lay eggs with. And what's this? Wasp? Not? Not? Hands up, not. Not. You're wrong, it's a wasp. <laughs> it's actually called a velvet ant, to confuse you even more. Um, but it is a wasp. It's a, it's a rare example of a wasp that has no wings. Um, and so it will, um, it preys on honeybees, and it paralyzes them with its fabulous sting, and digs a hole, puts a bee in the hole, lays an egg, seals it up, and lets the egg hatch out and eat the honeybee from the inside out. What's that? It's a mantid. It's not a wasp. <laughs> and these? Yeah, they are wasps. Lots of people say these are bees because they've got cute little fur, uh, round heads. Um, but this is actually called, oh, again, a confusing common name. It's called a, um, a bee wolf. Um, so it's even more confusing. Um, and it also hunts, um, hunts bees. What about these? Well, is, this, is this? That's another velvet ant, actually. What about this one? What's this? Beetle? That's a favourite. It's not a beetle, it's a wasp. This is Megalara. It's a male wasp um, that has these enormous mandibles, and it's a rare example of sexual selection for uh, males to fight. They have these big mandibles to fight over access to females. And these? Wasps? Yeah, they are wasps. These are some of the largest wasps. You can see that's a centimetre. They're huge. And this is the smallest wasp. It's a wasp. It's actually called a fairy wasp. Isn't that cute? You see, they're darlings. I told you, they're really darlings. So just to ram that home, the wasps are incredibly diverse. They're beautiful. Um, and they show such an array of morphologies and exquisite um, behaviours and... and um, they, they are truly incredible. So don't ever think a wasp is just that pesky yellow jacket at your picnic. 
OK, so let's move on to the sophistication of wasps. Now, we think human societies are amongst the most sophisticated. Well, actually, you're wrong. Um, although Adam Smith, of course, is famous from the 1700s for revolutionizing the way that our factories work in creating the factory um, production line. So people specialize in different tasks. It makes the output of the factory much more um, productive. But actually, wasps did this 250 million years before we even thought about it. And one of the really fun things um, about wasps is that it's actually just like, the reason I like watching wasps is it's like watching a soap opera. Um, so this is a colony of one of my favorite wasps. It's called Polistes canadensis. We watch these a lot in Panama. We recently sequenced the genome of these insects, and that was the first wasp genome to be sequenced. And you can see they've got little number tags on, the, on their backs. Um, and so we're able to follow these wasps from the minute they emerge as adults, the minute they're born, we can follow them throughout their entire life. And we can manipulate them. We can take some wasps away and see what happens. So it's just like EastEnders. You get to play around with the script and see who responds and see what happens next. So wasps are truly the soap opera glamour ladies of the insect world. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is looking at the genes that underpin these different behaviors within these simple societies. So we look at their DNA and their gene expression, um, and we, um, we look at the brain. So one of the great things about the wasps that I work on is that they're big. They're nice big wasps, and big wasps means big heads. Big heads means big brains. Big brains means lots of material for us to mash up their brains and look at the genes that are expressed in those individual brains of individual insects. You can't do that with humans. You can't mash up your brains and find out why you're behaving aggressively and why you're being submissive, but we can do it with wasps. And so by doing these manipulations in the field, taking our insects home to the lab, looking at the genes that underpin those behaviors, we can start to build a map from the genes to the behaviors to understand how genes interact with the environment, the social environment, to produce these behaviors. And in fact, one of the things that's come out of this sort of work on bees, wasps, and ants, by looking at their behavior and, and connecting the genes to the behaviors, is that the worker caste in these social societies, so much like your worker honeybee, who doesn't have any chance of ever being a reproductive, um, she's working her guts out for the colony for the good of passing on her genes, through the relatives that she's helping raise, the workers are actually the evolutionary innovation. They're the clever ones. So like any good factory in human society, its product depends heavily on the worker force, a good, innovative worker force. And it's exactly the same in social insects. So the third word I'd like to take you to take home with you about wasps today is that they are phenomenal. And this is a phenomenal wasp nest. This, again, is a Polistes paper wasp that you'll see if you go on holiday to the continent. And it's colored, multicolored for a reason. This nest has been reared in the lab. And you can give them different types of paper, a uh, different colored paper, and they will build a nest that's multicolored by giving them different colors. Because these are paper wasps. And in fact, most wasps, the, the, um, the yellow jacket wasp that you know so well, also builds their nest out of paper. So they'll take plant material, they'll chew it up, and they will smooth it out into the most intricate, light, but strong um, nesting material. And um, there is a theory that we might even have wasps to thank for the origin of paper that has transformed our own societies. So the story goes that a Chinese eunuch was sitting under a tree 2,000 years ago, and he happened to see this wasp, just like one of these, chewing a bit of bark off the tree, um, chewing it up in its mandibles, and then spreading it out into this beautiful uh, paper. And he thought, that's a blimmin' good idea. I'm going to do that. And therein was born paper. But wasps have gone on much further than we've done with our boring flat paper. These are all different types of wasp nests that are built out of paper. They are incredible architects. And the architecture of the nest can, in fact, tell us about the evolution of sociality. So not all ill wasps are highly social, like your, your yellow jacket wasp, which is effectively just like a honeybee, but it's a wasp. Um, many wasps are solitary. They live alone. Um, and they uh, will just dig a hole and lay their egg and then seal it up and say bye-bye. There's no parental care. But what I'm really interested in 
is how we get to these really complex societies, which are just like the honeybee colonies. And the wasps are second to none in providing us with these snapshots in evolutionary time. So I travel around the world seeking out wasps that represent these different steps on the ladder of social evolution. And it's an incredible opportunity. It's like, it's like watching evolution in action. And I get to go to some nice places as well. Um, but one of the key defining features of sociality is that workers give up the chance to reproduce in order to help raise relatives. And that's one of the founding understandings of why sociality, uh, our understanding of sociality. However, what we found by putting little um, Oyster card equivalents on our wasps to radio tag them, uh, we found that not all wasps are faithful. In fact, they often spend time on different nests. And so we're using behavioral experiments in the field and also genetic methods in the lab to understand why wasps might not actually be as faithful as theory predicts. Okay, so the final um, take home for why wasps are important and why they really truly are the darlings of the insect world is this word here, because they are essential. Everybody thinks of bees being that, uh, the, pit, the epitome of the, of the, of the service that the insects give to us. The bees are so important in pollination, and it's absolutely true. I'm not disputing that. But what I'm going to try to convince you now is that wasps are equally important. Because wasps are the natural pest controllers. They eat the insect pests that you hate. They eat the caterpillars that riddle your, um, your lettuces. They eat the aphids that plague your tomato plants. Without wasps, your garden would be inundated with insects. And this is the, so the, one of the really um, good things about wasps is that they're generalists. They're not fussy about what kind of insect they eat. This is a food web network that we've put together from the literature. And these are the three main groups of social wasps. And the power, the predatory power of wasps is so much greater for the solitary wasps than the, uh, the social wasps than the solitary because a single colony can have tens of thousands of workers, all of whom are going out into your garden and removing that, those pests that you don't want. So around, around the top here are the different um, types, different groups of insect prey that those, or arthropod prey, that those social wasps predate on. Um, and the, the larger the, the circle indicates the more representation of that group um, in these wasps' diets. So the main groups are the lepidoptera, and those are the caterpillars. They eat the caterpillars, not the beautiful butterflies, just the caterpillars. Um, the diptera, those are the flies. So they're really good for controlling fly populations. And other hymenoptera, so those little, bee, little bees, little ants, little wasps, they will be eating all of those. And the hemipterans the bugs that you don't want on your, inside, on, on your plants in the, in the garden. Um, and they do some cool stuff to uh, control. It's not just eating these insects that they do. They also um, mess with their brain. So this lovely wasp here um, met, it, it, um, injects neurotoxins um, into the brain of the cockroach, which is my most disliked. I hate cockroaches. Do you like, they're even worse than wasps, aren't they? Let's face it. Um, anyway, it, it, lays, it, 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 it penetrates the brain, and it messes with the brains of these cockroaches, and they become these zombies. And then this tiny little wasp will carry this huge cockroach to its nest and then let its babies feed off it. It's like a living, la a living larder. It's fabulous stuff. So wasps actually do eat anything, and we've known this for hundreds of years. This drawing dates back to the early 1900s, where it is clearly a wasp eating a fly. You knew that, right? Um, and so we know that wasps, we've known that wasps eat anything, um, but we haven't actually capitalized on that. We, we capitalized on the fact that bees pollinate our crops, but we haven't capitalized, capitalized on the fact that wasps are our natural pest controllers. They could reduce the amount of pesticide that we have to use. There are over 30,000 species of predatory wasps as the ones that actually go and catch your aphids. Um, they're, in, they're generalists in their, their diet, so actually any wasps in your garden will control any pests that you've got. Um, and they present no little, very little threat to those other insect populations because they're not specialists, so they're not going to wipe out an entire set of uh, insects. So the million-dollar question is how much do wasps eat? And actually the reality is that we don't know because they're very understudied. Most of the studies on the yellow jacket wasps um, comes from uh, New Zealand, where they are an invasive species, 
and they form extraordinarily large colonies there. So this is probably an overrepresentation of what they eat. But scientists have looked to see how much um, uh, prey, mass of prey, um, a, a wasp colony will remove per season. And it's estimated to be up to 23 kilos. That's a lot of aphids. In fact, by my recommend, uh, rec rec um, calculations, that's about 250,000 aphids from a single colony. In fact, this is an estimate of a very, a very um, um, conservative estimate. That's a lot of aphids in your garden, right? Would you like to have 250,000 aphids in your garden, or would you rather have a wasp nest? Actually, we're not going to ask you that. <laughs> OK, so wasps are really important as biocontrols. They're generalists. Um, because they're social, um, they recruit. They can recruit other workers to come and find those aphids to the same tomato plant. Um, they eat caterpillars and flies, which are the key pests not only of your garden, but also of, of crops. So wasps are really, um, they're asking for us to learn more about them so that we can better manage them as potential biocontrol agents. Now, enough about their carnivorous behavior. Um, wasps are also important pollinators. Yep, they visit flowers because the adult wasps, actually, they don't care two hoots about the prey. They catch an insect prey, but they don't eat it. They take it back to their nest and they'll feed it to the larvae. It's the larvae that, who are the carnivores. The adult wasps are actually um, frugiv frugivores. They need, uh, fruit, they need um, sugar, which they get from plants. And um, wasps, again, are generalist pollinators. They will visit those plants. And we've discovered that there are over 650 species of plants that wasps have been observed visiting, coming from a, a huge range of plant families. Um, and un unlike bees, they are generalists. And so in many ways, they're complementary to bees because bees often are very specific to the type of plant that they will pollinate. Wasps don't care. They'll go anywhere. And the other good thing about wasps is that they like living in really, really horrible places. Some of my top field sites have been sewage works, um, a leprosy hospital in Panama, abandoned buildings with gunshots on the wall, they love these abandoned places that no one else wants to go. So wastelands, um, urban environments that are just, just left to ruin. The bees won't like them. They're terribly fussy. They like the nice, pretty flowers. The wasps don't care. They'll go in and they'll pollinate anything. They're just not fussy. So they're like the backup follow follow pollinators. When the habitat is just not pristine enough for a bee, the wasps will step up to the cause. Now, this is the inside of a wasp nest. Now, um, what do you see? What's this? This is an egg. Um, it's a bit fuzzy, isn't it? Uh, this is actually a larva. Can you see that? And the one at the top there is a larva who spun her cocoon into a pupa. Now, I look at that as a field biologist. I think, yep, yeah, that's a wasp nest. There's a larva and an egg, a couple of eggs and a pupa. Now, if you're one of 2.5 million people in the world who eat insects, this means food to you. Entomophagy, the eating of insects the, the, as, as a source of protein, is something that we need to catch on to here in the West because there is so much, there is, the, in Asia and in, in, um, in, in Africa, Asia and Latin America, eating insects is actually quite a large part of these people's diet. And they're, they're onto a good thing here because actually insects and particularly wasp larvae are very high in protein content and very low in fat. So they're actually really good for you. And moreover, they're much more sustainable to harvest than to farm. And in fact, the Japanese love them so much that they've made these cookies with little chocolate larvae popping out. Isn't that cute? Um, and it's actually a kind of a new, a new thing in Japan now. In the last 30 years or so, local families in rural areas have actually started farming wasps. So this is a cultural shift that they're now, it's not a historic thing that, that, that's from the past. It's something that they've realized is really valuable. And whole families will sit there harvesting the larvae out of their family wasp nests at the end of the season. So the final question I'd like to put to you is what, given that I've now hopefully convinced you that wasps are really important, really valuable, um, important to our ecosystems, important to our, um, our potentially to our, our nutritional uh, needs, um, what would a, wasp, a world without wasps look like? And there's a famous quote by, I'm not quite sure who, because it's certainly not Einstein, is that when the bees disappear, 
man only has four years left. So I think we need a similar quote for the wasp. But we're going to make it evidence-based. But the problem is that actually it's not just you guys who hate wasps. It's the scientists as well. I'm actually a rarity in that I actually like wasps and I study them. This is a, a graph where I've, put, I've calculated the number of papers that, sci that scientists have produced over the last 30 years on bees, wasps, and ants. And the blue, li the blue line here is the, is the ants, a cumulative sum over time. Um, th this is the bees, and these are the wasps. And you can see the wasps at the bottom. And you think, well, it's not that different, until you look at the representation of the species. So uh, the ants actually represent only about 6% of the bees, wasps, and ants altogether. And yet, almost half the scientific papers on these three groups are on ants. Bees have received a lot of attention recently, for obvious reasons, but they only represent 11% of the bees was finance in terms of species, and yet 32% of the publication output of these scientists is on bees. Wasps, on the other hand, they represent 83% of the species among the bees was finance, and yet only 21% of these papers are on wasps. So the scientific community are not providing us with the evidence or the, the studies that we need in order to better understand the ecological and economic value of wasps. So just to finish off with, I'm going to give you a little bit of a plug for a citizen science project that I started last year with Adam Hart at the uh, University of, of Gloucestershire. It's called the Big Wasp Survey. Did anyone here take part? Yay! You people, excellent. Um, and so what we wanted to do is to harness the power of the public to, uh, fight, to help us learn more about UK wasps. Um, and so we asked people to put these uh, lovely beer traps out in their garden around about bank holiday, August, bank holiday time. Leave it out there for a week and then collect the contents um, and send them to us at UCL. Um, beer is a great attractant for social wasps and it doesn't attract other insects quite so much. Um, and so we were absolutely uh, amazed that people wanted to do this. In fact, it was a bit of a whim. Um, and astonishingly, uh, we had far too many people take part. Um, people were sending us in pictures that their kids had drawn of wasps. It was like wasp crazy. It was amazing. Two and a half thousand people signed up. We had um, 1,200 people actually send in their results, and our freezers in UCL were literally bursting. Uh, and Peggy, give us a wave, Peggy. Peggy there sitting in the, in the middle actually had the joyous task of sorting out all these slightly decayed wasps from, these, sample, from these, uh, these, these packages that had been sent in. And we also managed to get lots of volunteers to come and help us sort these literally thousands of insects. Um, and this is actually one from uh, Peggy thesis. So, sorry, Peggy, I've stolen it there. Um, from our, this is a map of where people in the UK provided us with data. So you can see that people all over the country have sent in their wasp samples. And this is incredibly valuable because it's going to tell us about which species of wasps are where in the UK so we can better understand the ecological um, niches that these wasps occupy and how they're responding to different kinds of land use. Um, so please do get involved in August this year. Um, this is my toddler with his beer trap, so even children can do this. It's, it's very safe. Um, put up your trap. Um, in your garden, and uh, go to our website and find out more about how to do that. Okay, so I would hope that if I were to, do, to, to uh, commission a wordle um, of this room on words that you might use as audience members to describe wasps after this talk, I hope that you might describe wasps as fascinating, of having ecological value, of being phenomenal, of being essential, useful, diverse, misunderstood, but most importantly, that they are an important source of natural capital. This is why wasps are the neglected darlings of the natural world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarian. So now you, you know, don't approach this woman and tell her something negative about wasp. I wouldn't. <laughs> um, so um, I know some of you will have a question for Sarian. Uh, so please bear with us because the idea here is to go through both talks and then have the two experts sitting here and take your uh, question. 
So the second speaker I'd like to introduce here is Professor Kate Jones. Um, I like the contrast between those two speakers. As you may have seen, Syrian is very into WASP and quite specialized in what she's interested in. Kate, I can get, you could get her interested in more or less anything as long as the question uh, keep, gets her interested. Um, she's a bit of a jack of all trade, although she does have um, quite a bit of a, a love for bats, has been working with the bats uh, trust for many years. And that I think is the first time I talked to science uh, with Kate was about bats. Um, so Kate is interested in the tree of life in general, in uh, various conservation issues. She has been doing a lot of work on uh, representation of species, uh, some form of taxonomies, but what really gets her uh, tickled nowadays is uh, technology and how to advance conservation by making use of all the data and all the development uh, and all the technology that could eventually get us to understand better uh, the natural world and therefore conserve it better. So you will get a, a full-on uh, presentation of, of what I mean by this and what really gets her interested. Um, but please help me welcome Kate now. So thank you very much for that introduction. Thanks very much for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to be back at uh, ZSL uh, for the lunch hour lectures on tour. Um, so, as Natalie was saying, uh, I used to work here as, as well as Sarian, and, um, uh, and, and I actually have never left, really. I've got an honorary appointment here, so uh, it just shows you the pull of this place. It's, it's, it's very special and strong. So, as Natalie said, I've been really interested in trying to understand um, the kind of biodiversity, what well, biodiversity, what's happening to biodiversity, and what are the trends, and, and what are our impacts on uh, on nature, what, what are humans doing to biodiversity? But um, alongside that, there's been a, an absolute revolution in the amount of technologies and tools that are available to understand these trends. And I guess I've, I've been absolutely fascinated by these and trying to develop those into uh, things that we can use to start to monitor nature in a much better way. And, and the reason for monitoring nature is to understand our impacts and then manage nature better, or, or I should say manage our impacts on nature better, so that we can uh, conserve species better. So the problem really, and this is the title of the talk, is uh, there's a lot of kind of um, fear around technology at the moment, and especially kind of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And some of these tools use artificial intelligence to monitor species and, and populations. So I guess the question is, you know, should we be worried about that? Should we be worried that robots will take our conservation jobs? So uh, maybe we could do away with the Institute of Zoology and have some machine learning robots instead. So there's some c controversies around that clearly and I'm gonna take you through some of the technologies which have, have been developed recently, some of the machine learning and artificial intelligence tools that we can use with a kind of specific focus on my own work, which is on acoustics. So let me just start then uh, by showing you uh, what the state of the planet is in and, and the reason why there's a problem with our wild nature and degradation of natural ecosystems is because there's a load of us. So <laughs> this is the human population. Uh, so in 1760, where this, is, this graph is starting, uh, the populations were fairly stable of human, humans, so we had quite a, a huge mortality, child mortality, which kept the, our numbers down and our, our shorter lifespans. And then around uh, 1980, there was peak baby, so there were more babies then than there ever were ever in the history of our species. So this red line here is the growth rate of... Um, of uh, the human population, and the blue one is the, the number of, 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 of humans. So um, our growth rate is fortunately coming down a bit, and so um, it's be, uh, our populations are supposed to level off around 2100. But that means there's a huge number of um, pressures on our environment causing widespread, 
widespread uh, conversion of our land and degradation of our natural ecosystems. This isn't a depressing talk. This is a depressing start. We'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is uh, another uh, graph that I pulled out for, just to kind of summarize our impact on the planet. So you've got, in this far left uh, graph, you've got uh, the global sur land surface of the planet. Oh, gosh. No. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me just do it manually. Okay. Fine. Where did you do that? Okay. Hooray. Okay, so we've got uh, the global uh, land surface here, uh, just a kind of measure of, of what that's divided into, and you can't quite see that, but 30% um, of it is, a, is land and the rest is ocean. And, uh, and this 30% of land, um, three quarters of it is habitable, and half of the habitable land is used to make stuff for us or us, which is, uh, is, is quite scary. <laughs> And um, shockingly, about three quarters of the agricultural land is used to make meat for us to eat. So perhaps not the, the best use of, of resources there. Uh, and this is just showing you the kind of, um, a, a kind of sum of how much, how much humans have appropriated in terms of resources the, the planet's kind of um, biomass. So this is, a, this is how much productivity um, we, we have on the planet in terms of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, green. This is, this is just showing you um, how much um, productivity we're using instead of it being um, natural uh, ecosystems. So you've got uh, areas of the planet which are, are almost using 100% of the, of the planet's productivity, which is, is really scary. So what uh, implications has that on our ecosystems and our natural environment? Well, this is uh, image, images, uh, photographs of uh, all the, well, some of them, of endangered species across the planet. And, and we're seeing a precipitous loss in biodiversity uh, all around us. Uh, if you have a chance, do look at this project because uh, Joel is, is trying to photograph all endangered species before they go extinct. <laughs> so he's got a fantastic website if you want to have a look, and this is just some of the images from that. So okay, we're losing biodiversity, we're degrading our natural ecosystems, and, and does that matter? And I think that's a really good question, does it matter? And I think the work at ZSL and UCL and, and across the world has, has been showing that it really does. And this is just um, a kind of conceptual model, if you like, of, of the argument for why ecosystems matter. So you've got here, uh, there are lots of them, this is just one, one particular one I'm showing you as an example. So you've got all of life in this box here, this green box, and it's, it's partitioned up into ecosystems like a forest or a pond or uh, your park next door to your house. And then uh, there are some kind of ecosystem services which those areas provide. Uh, and those things could be, say, uh, pollination. Um, and the goods that are produced are the crops that we eat. And so these have an impact on our human health and well-being. So when Sarian was talking about wasps and their pollination ability and also their pest control ability, they're classed as ecosystem services and producing goods for us. So this is a, it's a quite an ecocentric, anthropogenic-centric view of uh, why nature is, is good and why we should not destroy it. And that is controversial. Just see any article by George Monbiot. But um, <laughs> this is a, a kind of a useful way, I think is a useful way, to communicate to policymakers how important biodiversity and ecosystem services are to us in terms of our health and our well-being. So if biodiversity is so important, we are it's shocking that we're so terrible at monitoring it. We are absolutely terrible at doing that. And um, I've got kind of um, climate modelers envy. So the climate modelers have like stations all across the world monitoring weather and rainfall and temperature all the time. And they've got satellites doing the same thing and they produce these amazing models and they have modeling teams all around the world and then they've got a, 
uh, a UN in, a kind of commission to look at these models, to make recommendations to the planet about why climate's increasing, what to do about it, what our legal frameworks are. And for biodiversity, we've got hardly anything like that at all. And um, you know, you can, the climate modelers have got lots of scenarios where, you know, in terms of policy uh, in, implement, instruments to change governmental policies. And really, <sighs> biodiversity is, is severely lacking in this, in this regard. And, 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 and understanding it's important, uh, considering its importance, it, it's a real shock that we don't have something like that. Now, um, as, as we've been going on, that there's been this revolution, as I said, in, in sensing technology and algorithms to understand our natural environment. And whether we could kind of use those tools to create platforms which are much smarter in monitoring our ecosystems is something I'm really interested in. And I, I uh, was talking, I do a lot of work with engineers, and um, I was talking to them about this idea of, of trying to monitor the planet in a much better way. And they talked about Industry 4.0. And I was like, I've got no idea what you're saying. What are you saying? What are those words? What? I don't understand. So this is a, a diagram I pulled off the web. So if you have a look at it on, on Wikipedia, you'll find something called Industry 4.0. So this is an idea. Say Amazon, for example, would think about Industry 4.0. So uh, this is a kind of diagram which is describing the um, transition between Industry 1.0 to Industry 4.0. So Industry 1.0 is the satanic mills of the north, of the north uh, creating um, these huge amounts of, of productivity through mechanization and steam energy and, and weaving, and, and those were kind of uh, mass production of, um, uh, uh, production of, of, um, <coughs> of, um, of goods and services. And then Industry 2.0 is like mass production, assembly line, like think of a Ford factory. And then you've got something like Industry 3.0, which is automation, computers, and electronics. So think of a Samsung factory or a Toyota car plant with all those robots, you know, those videos of robots doing stuff. And then we've got this kind of mythical 4.0, ah, 4.0 over here, where you've got cyber physical systems. So what on earth are those? So Internet of Things, networks. So cyber physical systems are not just computers, uh, robots doing stuff, you know, putting a bolt on a, uh, on a car, but they are learning how to build the bolt on a car, react to, the react to other things that are happening, take decisions, and then change how they're doing that. And those are cyber physical systems in terms of they are reacting to the environment, they're learning with artificial intelligence, and then, then doing something else that's different to maximize your production. So Amazon has this already in their factories. So if you're wondering why you order something and it comes and delivered the same day, it's because they have this system in place, or in some factories anyway. So I'm interested in how we can put conservation into that framing. So um, if I think about conservation, it's probably barely past one, maybe two in this system. So industry 1.0 and 2.0 are all about kind of me uh, like mechanization or using tools like, uh, you know, uh, mist nets to catch birds or bats. It's, you know, looking at uh, using camera traps to, to find out what is in a, in a, in a forest or sensors. And then, you know, sometimes we use, as Sarian was talking about, um, citizen science to mass produce our recordings and sensing, and sensing across the environment. So perhaps we're at one, and, and for some things we're at two. So this is an example of uh, Conservation 2.0. I had to put bats in here somewhere, and this is a, a, um, a, a monitoring trend from the Bat Conservation Trust, which they do every year, using a big citizen science survey across the country to produce these trends in population change with time. So perhaps we're at this uh, one and maybe two, but could we be at three and four? You know, four is maybe it's too crazy to think about how we could be there. But perhaps that's the way that we will really start to to monitor and understand what our systems are. So instead of just monitoring it, we could then take decisions about what we need to change automatically and then optimize the system for both people and for our natural ecosystems. 
Okay, so I'm just going to go through some of the, the kind of ways that we could become more three and four and end with some, some examples from my own work which uh, have kind of gone through this thought process. <clears throat> so this is um, the, the first kind of revolution which has been going on uh, with camera traps. And these are traps that you put, cameras that you put into forests or wherever you like, back gardens. And you can, they flash when an animal goes past and you can take a picture or a video or whatever you want. And this is an image uh, that was taken from a colleague's project in Liberia in 2011. Uh, he put camera traps all over the forest in Liberia and um, they found a pygmy hippo. And this is the first time that this had been found in Liberia. And the president was so excited about this that she set the entire area up as a nature reserve. So these images are incredibly powerful, have an incredible power to change people's minds and impressions of what's there. And, and these, these camera traps and the camera trapping system has uh, opened up new uh, records of species and our understanding of what's, what's around. So it's not just Liberia and foreign places. This is Muswell Hill, my back garden. I just planted that, so that was annoying that I got a whole family of foxes in my garden, <laughs> which they took great pleasure in tearing up. But they were very cute, so that was good. Uh, so, this, so this can happen anywhere. You can put them out and have a look in. And it's got a real power of engagement as well. So this is a completely engaging. I had no idea this was going on. I was wondering why the cats were looking a little bit shady, you know, shifty in the back garden. And not just Muswell Hill or in terrestrial landscapes. This is Dave Kernick, one of my PhD students. Um, he was setting up cameras on the bottom of the seabed and also uh, videos of, of coral reefs. So you can put these things into areas which you, can't, you couldn't usually monitor with anything else. So these are big marine reserves which are difficult to now monitor because the typical way of monitoring ecosystems in marine systems is to, to fish them. <laughs> so you look at the fish stocks and of course you can't do that in marine protected areas. So we need other kind of sensors in order to uh, to monitor those things. So there's been a huge revolution in the, in the, in the power, the complexity, and um, you know, the, the uh, usability of these sensors, which is just extraordinary. The other big revolution is in things that you put on animals. So these are like tags that you can put on. So something like um, at the, in your phone, you've got a kind of accelerometer, which helps you play games. Not that you'd be playing games on your phone or anything. But it gives you a kind of way to understand uh, your, uh, how you're moving, if you're going up and down or to the side. And you can put those types of uh, sensors into, into uh, uh, collars, into movement tags. So these also can have a GPS so that they can connect to the satellite information. And it gives you lots and lots of information about what the animal is doing. Uh, so for example, this is a, um, an image from one of my favorite programs of recent times, Horizon 2013. They all went into an Oxfordshire village and, sat up, and set up Cat Central. And they got all the cats owners of the village to come around and they all got a little collar. This is a GoPro camera and an accelerometer. And they put them on the cats and let them go. And this guy apparently didn't do anything all day, he just sat on the couch uh, and just ate food. Uh, actually, he was traveling about 20 kilometers a night and raiding lots of other food from everybody else's house in the village and picking lots of fights. So, you know, this, this, is, uh, these, this technology has really revolutionized our understanding of, of animal behavior and, and, and using this, we can really start to, instead of just monitoring it with, with binoculars or sitting there for hours, you can put these tags on and get much finer grain detail of the data. So, for example, these are three kind of um, data channels you get from accelerometer tag, which show you pitch, uh, movement, side-to-side uh, -side movement, and, and acceleration. So you can start to uh, ground truth these, these bands of information with behaviors. So this is upright, horizontal, but it could be feeding or or, or, uh, or um, caring for young or whatever, but you can, you can translate these mass amounts of information you're getting from these sensors into behaviors. Okay, so the next kind of thing, and this is going on to my own research, is on, is on uh, acoustic sensing. 
So I've been really interested in how we use acoustics to monitor our environment better. And um, I love bats. It's like a confession, but I do. I think they're fantastic. And they use echolocation to find their way around and to localize and identify objects. And they leak this information out uh, of themselves all the time when they're feeding and traveling around. And so it's possible to use the information that's coming out of, of, um, of bats as they're flying around as a way to monitor our environment. And, in more, and generally, you can do that with a lot of wildlife that make noise. And it's also possible that you could use this bioacoustics to monitor cities because you could, you could, because we make noise and cars make noise and planes make noise. So we can understand this acoustic surrounding of our environment using, uh, using acoustic sensors. So I set up uh, a long time ago now, um, in, two, in, in 2006, a big citizen science project where I got people to uh, drive set transects with bat detectors on top of their cars. So I'm just going to show you a clip of that. We have the lights down a little bit. Our bats are in trouble, but how much trouble? We have 17 species of bats, but for some, numbers are crashed. But for others, it's not so clear. To find out exactly what's going on, it's essential to monitor that numbers. Not easy. Okay, I think there's enough of that. Uh, so so uh, I got a load of people to take part in uh, understanding what bats were surrounding acoustic surveys uh, from in a reverse Genghis Khan move from the UK over to Mongolia and Japan. So we had a huge number of people that were involved. And uh, this was funded by the Darwin Initiative and we went into, uh, into the different countries and worked with an NGO present and uh, gave them training and, and uh, equipment to understand and start mapping out the bats that were present. So that was all, uh, so a lot, a lot, huge numbers of uh, amount of data was coming from uh, these, these surveys all across the world. So I had a, a petabyte of data. I didn't even know what a petabyte was, but now I do. Uh, so it's not just me with loads of data and all of these high frequency recordings, but also acoustic recordings and, ca and images from cameras. Um, there are a huge number of biodiversity apps now which help you record and um, monitor um, wildlife populations. So, for example, uh, there's um, uh, FSC have got a guide to the wildlife around you so that you can take that into the field and, and look at, at stuff. iNaturalist is a fantastic app which you can log all your sightings of, of the things that you see. Anybody can take part in that. And Ladybird uh, app has got um, a whole key, but also is a recording scheme for that. So there's a, a huge number of, of these apps now, which are, are generating masses and masses and masses of, of data. And, and therein lies one of the big problems, is that we've got this huge revolution in sensing equipment, but we've got very few tools or understanding on how to develop uh, tools to go through petabytes of information of very complex biodiversity information. 
Um, so one of the ways is to start doing automation, and this is where these new, these new kind of uh, algorithms are coming in. So this is an old school way, and um, this is a fantastic website if you want to have a look at it, called iSpot, run by Jonathan Silvertown. He's a friend of mine, so I don't think he'd mind me calling him old school there. But um, what, what you do is upload any photos that you take, and uh, there's a network of, of um, experts behind this website that will identify things for you. So these are just volunteers, and there's a kind of a badge system. It's like eBay, but you know, if you're good at, um, at recognizing what fungi are, you get like three badges. You know? So you get a kind of a score as you go on. So the more you get right, the bigger your score is. So it's quite, it's quite a cool system. And so I asked him a kind of a mean turnaround time of identification on this website, and he told me about three seconds. So that's insane. It's insane that somebody uh, well, there's a huge number of people that are, are looking at this stuff. So you can do it manually if you have some kind of system behind that, which, um, which is using the power of um, volunteers. However, um, back calls are really hard to identify, and um, what we wanted to do was to try to do it automatically. So we got in touch with the guys from Zooniverse who uh, are at Oxford, and uh, they normally deal, deal with... Um, galaxies, you know, so they take pictures of galaxies and then they, they go through the images and they use lots of citizen scientists to tell you what shape they are and then they develop algorithms to go through all of this automatically. So this one I've got a picture of is called Old Weather and um, this one, um, there's a problem with the climate data in that they don't have any from the sea. And so this project um, digitized all the ship records from Greenwich, and the whole point of this project is you log in and you pretend to be a ship's captain and you go through all of the records and you pull out all of the climate data in the ship's logs. So this is an ingenious way to get information and to, to create these automatic machine learning tools uh, to go through things automatically. So of course I set one up called Back Detective uh, with a huge number of people and a lot of computer scientists from UCL and the Back Conservation Trust. And I asked lots and lots of people uh, to identify the calls in the recordings. And I had a key so that you can understand what uh, bat calls they were. And we have different, bats use different types of calls, not just for uh, finding food, but also for singing to each other, which is very cute, and, uh, and feeding as well. So when you, they get closer to an insect, they increase the frequency of their, their calls and so that they get much more information about the insects. So there's lots of feeding social and searching calls. So I had about half a million annotations uh, and about 8,000 people that, uh, of registered users with half a million annotations. And some of them did uh, over 50,000 each, which is insane. Uh, so with using this data, we started to uh, develop our kind of pipeline for analyzing these data so that you'd have the information uh, the raw information here and the sound, we transform that into something that we is much easier to see, this frequency uh, transform into a sonogram, it's called a sonogram. And then uh, we have the signals detected with all of our volunteers that are finding the back calls, and then classification into uh, the different species. Now, uh, in, you can do this normally by taking information out of each call and parameterizing it, so how long it is, how high it is. Or you can use some of the um, stuff that Google are using uh, for playing Go, I think, at the moment, with robots. But it's also uh, that's the type of information that Siri uses on your phone or, or Google Assistant uses to recognize your voice, called deep learning. And deep learning doesn't take any information. You don't have to extract any information out of the call. It kind of does it for you. So it decides what information is important about that call to distinguish it from others. So we apply deep learning. To, I love saying deep learning. It sounds very, very cool. Uh, to our back data for the first time ever in the world. And we developed this classifier. So I slowed that down because back call is very high, too high for you to hear. So um, I've slowed it down for you to hear. So you get a probability curve um, when there's a back call. So our, our detector works pretty well. And we can apply that in lots and lots of different uh, situations. So one of our uh, volunteer groups was in Jersey. For those that you've temporarily forgotten where Jersey is, 
is north of France, a tiny island. And uh, I won't say tiny, it's um, <coughs> beautifully sized, perfectly sized. Uh, so uh, we have a really active Jersey back group who are amazing and a tiny bit crazy, but amazing. And uh, they did, uh, tra they've done transect, driven transects around Jersey for the last seven years. Um, so it's not so much as a sampled area of Jersey as a census of Jersey's bats, because I think we've got all of them now in our survey. So all of the, the, all of the roads have been covered. So this is a map uh, using our uh, kind of a pipeline, so the citizen science pulling all the data through and then generating our maps of occurrence of these species and then applying that into a trend line of what the abundance is of the population. So we're really starting to become a little bit more maybe conservation 3.0, but not quite yet 4.0. So this is a way to, to rapidly generate lots of data and then understand what the populations are doing within uh, the system. So what we've uh, been doing is experimenting with new designs of these sensors. So they were pretty clunky when they were attached to the car and very expensive. And that's a real barrier for participation. And so we've been developing with Oxford, uh, Alex Rogers in Oxford, uh, a really cheap sensor that you can put into your garden. So these are about 20 pounds. And uh, you can get those and put them in your garden and understand what, what, what bats are around or what, what sounds or what biodiversity is around in the acoustic surroundings. And I had uh, my core student uh, go around Madeira, another perfectly sized island, perfectly formed island, uh, to collect all the data from Madeira. And it's got an endemic um, endangered species there, which um, is really important for us to monitor. So OK, we're, we're almost at, at, we've done three, but what about four? So I'll just finish on a project, which is probably the coolest project I've ever had the pleasure of working and, and the luck to be working on. And this is with. Uh, uh, Intel, the engineers at Intel, and uh, we really had a fantastic time. I just can say that. Okay, so this is um, our smart detectors system, so our Nature Smart project. So what we wanted to do was build detectors which had uh, chips inside, Intel chip, doesn't matter, it, what, it doesn't have to be Intel, but some chips inside the processing capability to drag through all of the recordings. We didn't have to store anything have to analyze anything, it would all do it for us, and then send the resulting uh, identifications to a website that you can have a look. And you can do this live. So I thought uh, this was really cool, and we talked to the, the London Legacy Development Corporation, our friends there, and we put them all in the Olympic Park. So the, the point is that we develop these uh, sensors to have these algorithms on board, and they listen to the bat, they partition it up, as I, I showed you with the, with the frequency transform. They detect and identify the bat, and then they give you a little report. So this is the, the box, this is the microphone, uh, this is the chip and the board, and uh, it's a power cord, and we attach them to lampposts. So this is the orbit, this is our lamppost, and this is our bat detector right here. So you, they're on now, so you can go and have a look at them. There's some information by each lamppost. These are the sites for, the, for the, where we put them. So we use a randomized stratified sample to make sure that we could cover the park habitats in the proportion that they're present. Uh, this is um, an awesome thing that the engineer at Intel got a bit overexcited and built, and built which is a bat gun. So this uh, shoots out echolocation calls so we can test these detectors, uh, the sensors as it will as we're going around the park. So we just pretended to be different bat species uh, on the different dials. So it's pretty retro, but I love the design. I thought that was awesome. Um, so this is some of the results. This is from July to December. So this uh, is our interface. You can have a look at this tonight because the bats will be out and you get a, a live report of what's going on. So these are all the sensors, and they flash with a white flash, white ring, when a bat is detected. And then uh, the red circle grows, and it's proportional to how many bats were found around each sensor. And if you click on a sensor, you get this whole detailed report about how many bats were, were around uh, in the night. And this kind of continues on during the night, and that gets reset the next day. So we've had enormous amounts of data, but fortunately we didn't have to process it, it was already processed. 
And so we can start to do the analysis straight away about mean calls per night, uh, but also in, in, what, in, what, um, in what habitats. Um, so this is something which I, I still gives me a, a, a shiver, is that I can, I can show you in one simple GIF three months of data in one go from sensors all around the park. And this has never, ever been done, ever, anywhere before in the world. And I think that is quite extraordinary that you can start to do that. Now, the thing that I think is extraordinary is that you can then start to build this into a 4.0 system where you can start to think, OK, I'm going to dim the lights in the park because I can, because, you know, LLDC are on board and I've got the switches. I can dim the lights and I'll see what happens to the bat activity in this park. And I can start to build a smart system which not only optimizes people's safety, but also the biodiversity present. So do I think Conservation 4.0 is possible? Yes, I do. And I welcome it. <laughs> that might be slightly controversial, but thank you very much. <laughs> to take some question as they take some water and have a seat. Is there any question for Kate or for Syrian? Uh, so, um, actually, since we've done the WASP work, well, we weren't the first to discover that, but um, we, so, so drifting, so we call it drifting, where insects go and visit other nests and spend time there. And that was actually spotted in bumblebees um, a year or so before um, we found it in the wasps. Um, and in fact, once we started publishing these papers, then many more of them came out. And I think what was happening is that, in fact, the way we discovered it is that we were using our old-fashioned... 1.0 <laughs> version, a technology version of marking our wasps with paint, like airfix paint, and then going up to the nest and seeing who was on the nest and doing these censuses manually. Um, and we were getting wasps on the wrong nest, and I just thought my group were being really sloppy. Um, and then we got these radio tags fitted, and we realised that actually, no, it wasn't sloppiness, it was that genuinely the wasps are moving. And so I think that this um, moving between nests is actually a lot more uh, common in social insects than we, we think it to be. So um, insects are, these, these workers are often unfaithful. Um, and so there are several explanations for that. Um, and it kind of depends on the species. But one of the, the thing that we found in the wasps was actually that the, um, the wasps that were drifting to other nests were in fact um, helping on those other nests. Um, and they were related to the brood on the other nests. And so by spreading their help across lots of different related nests, they may well be hedging their bets rather than putting all of their investment in one nest. Um, but that, that might be peculiar to the type of uh, population structure that we we are studying in that these wasps often nest in these abandoned buildings which are very convenient for us because they don't get washed away or blown off a tree. Um, but they also form these very viscous population structures so that that may be building up um, a more, more related populations than you would find in nature. You often get this nest drifting behaviour in apiaries with honeybees um, or when you have bumblebees in greenhouses for pollination purposes you get the drifting. Um, so in the bumblebees and the honeybees, it tends to be more that the uh, wasps, uh, the bees that drift to different nests are actually social parasites. So they're worker bees who can't mate, but they can still lay male eggs because of their crazy genetic system. Um, and so they sneak into other nests, dump an egg, and then fly out again. And of course that other nest, which it's unrelated to, will then have to bear the cost of raising those brood. I think there were a question around here. Did I did I see that right? Yes. For uh, Sue, very morning you must start to to fuss about their habitat or about what they eat uh, and what they do. Uh, are there are there clean insects? 
Do they carry parasites and bacteria? Um, it, people haven't really studied it very much at all. I mean, unlike bees, where there's an enormous amount of research effort going into looking at bee health, and we know that the parasite loads in bees have a big impact on the, how they're affected by pesticides, uh, we just simply don't have much information on parasites and pathogens of wasps. Um, they certainly do have some. There's a really cool one, which is um, a Strepsiptera parasite, which is an order all of its own, which, um, which lives inside uh, the wasp. Um, and then the, the, I think the, the female form, the female, the, the male doesn't actually have an adult, the female does, and you can see them poking out between the, um, the abdominal plates of the wasps. Um, and they're very peculiar and very understudied, but what we do know that they do is they mess with the behaviour of the wasps. So what they make workers do is to leave the nest and to spread, their, spread the parasites. It's basically a, a form of transmission. But that's a very peculiar kind of parasite. You don't get them here, don't worry. <laughs> More question? I may have one for Kate, actually. So you, you gave an example of your conservation 4.0 coming up. Have you seen more examples of this, or is it just one-off and you think you're hoping that people will follow that trend, or is there a different way to build it up to reach the 4.0? So basically, what's coming up? I think there's a lot of work on satellites, so the amazing uh, satellite data that's um, coming down at the moment. So we have a whole set of um, satellites which have been launched over the last few years and more to go up, these Sentinel satellites. And um, they're absolutely incredible. You can watch crops grow. So the amount of detail that's possible uh, could be utilised in a kind of monitoring system. And I think Natalie's talked about that before, but you could start to think about that in a 4.0 system that you've got these information coming down. The, um, the amount of power and technology that you will need and processing power to deal with that is enormous. And that's a really big challenge. But I think there could be these early warning systems or adaptive systems which we could, we could do with something like satellites, and I think that, that might be the fir first kind of thing that could come online. Yep. Professor Jones, um, and yeah, I was wondering, because the title was about uh, ro robots potentially stealing our job in that sense, is it not the other way around, that with these technologies people are becoming more attracted to the field because they can deal with their own phones or like to yeah, by participating to projects. So is it not kind of a reverse system in that sense? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think there's other ways to, to view that. And I do laugh when I see, you know, robots will take our jobs all across the news because of these AI tools. And I think that they just take some of the, um, the arduous tasks away from us that we're not actually that good at, like recognizing things. We're not not brilliant at doing that over lo long, large amounts of time and lots of information, and actually just sweeps that away and concentrates on the things we, we are actually good at, interpretation of those things and adapt, adapting to new environments. And I think it actually helps us and then, then attracts other people that might not be interest, have not been interested before and opens up the world to uh, you know, other people that, to take part in these projects. So, for example, those audio masks that are very cheap, like a, a bat detector would have cost you 150 quid up to 10,000 pounds, depending on what you wanted. But these are like 20 quid. I mean, you know, that's a totally doable thing. And so I'm working with Bat Conservation Trust at the moment to set up a new British bat survey, which would involve... Um, logging on to the system, you pick a square that you uh, agree to sign up to, we send you one of these audio masks as part of the survey, you put it in your garden or wherever you want, and you have the whole system, the AI system working on the internet on the Amazon server, and then you just get your report back, done. You know, and that's just a brilliant way of feeding back to you um, what's in your garden or what's in your surroundings, and then you're part of a bigger thing, you're part of a bigger survey. I mean, there are some dangers, I think, in terms of disengaging people with nature. So if all of this is happening somewhere else, 
you might not be as associated as, as with it as if you'd taken part in the survey, you know, on the ground painting wasps. So there is some, a challenge there to keep people interested, but asking different questions, I guess, with, with those tools. Yep. Um, well, I think we can safely say that that hasn't been done. Um, but we do. So, so one of the reasons we wanted to do the big wasp survey was to because we don't we don't have many long term records on insects that aren't so attractive. So there are many. I mean, Kate mentioned several of these. Um, recording schemes and citizen science schemes where many very gifted um, entomologists around the country will submit their records um, and, and and those are brilliant and they've done them for decades and it's really really valuable but wasps are underrepresented in those data sets and also it's very geographically biased so we don't it's very difficult to draw those sorts of conclusions with how they're changing with with them um, with weather. But there is uh, an example of what it was one study um, by Michael Archer, who'd been studying wasp populations in the same place for decades. Um, and there are there is the suggestion that they the wasp populations are certainly affected by uh, how wet the spring is. So if you get a very wet spring, then it affects the wasp populations. But as to whether the wasps can predict the weather, um, I think that's less likely. Oh. Child, I remember my parents or, or local people, depending on behavioural, the behaviour of mm. certain wasps, awesome. they could sort of say, oh, you know, it's yeah. very, very human. Right, so we've studied wasps in Trinidad, fabulous place for wasps, <laughs> lots of abandoned buildings. <laughs> um, and and uh, I guess the thing about the tropics, so it's, it's a bit different in the tropics, so I was thinking that you meant the UK. So in the, in the tropics, definitely, there is a big uh, response by wasps to uh, rainfall. And you have your dry season your, and your wet seasons. Um, and so once you get the, the wet seasons, it, that's where the, all the prey starts emerging. And so the wasps have got lots more food. And then the population starts exploding. And you'll probably see more wasps then. Uh, but it's interesting that you can say that they, they can preempt what's happening, changing pressure or something. I did. Yeah, so maybe that, I mean, what's that, the, the cue might simply be that there are prey that are emerging before we even notice them, but the wasps are one step ahead of us, maybe. Any more questions for Kate? What, yeah. Hi, just a quick question for Kate. Um, do you think it'd be possible to develop um, this kind of 4.0 smart technology um, for camera traps, you know, integrating some kind of image recognition software? I really do. And um, I think the computer scientists have, uh, it's been a long time to get them interested, but I think they now see that there are quite a lot of interesting questions that they can ask. So to get, a new, to get another discipline interested, you can't just ask them to do it for you. You have to say, there are some really interesting questions which you haven't solved and you can get a paper out of it. You know? so, so that's how you can get them involved. And, and I've been doing that at UCL um, uh, over the last few years. And there's been a growing interest in nature because they're interesting problems and it's cool. You know? So I think uh, a lot of people are getting more interested in that. So Google has got an AI already which can do I think large mammals in Africa based on the Serengeti, snapshot Serengeti data set. Yeah. So there's, there's an AI there that's available. And also on iNaturalist, they've been training some stuff on iNaturalist, all the images that are coming through. So I wouldn't say that it would be possible now to implement it and work tomorrow, but I think within the next few years, I think that would be possible. So you'd have to develop a camera trap which is capable of having a chip in it of ha running the AI on the chip, which is not simple, and then sending that data into a, a database and then producing reports. So there's quite a few steps there that need to be done. And you have to lower the price of the camera trap because yeah. uh, p people can't afford to buy them. So there are th a few things there that need to happen before you could do it. But I, I, I guarantee you it will be happening in the next few years. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right, so here and then here. Do you want to? Start? I don't know where the micro. But to go. <laughs> Uh, is is there a way to encourage more of them to be around? I mean, I've, usually when we get bug sprayed in Texas, we have a lot of bugs. We also have a lot of bats, bats in Austin. And I didn't <laughs> yeah. see us on that chart there. Um, largest colony of Mexican free tail bats, yeah. I think, in America. Cave. Um, but, and I used to be a beekeeper, so I value them, but I never thought about the, the wasps. And I always, when they have our house sprayed for bugs, I say only only spray the wasps that are by the doors, leave the rest of them. I'm sure they're doing a good job. But is there any, because I think they get the web worms out of the trees and stuff, but is there any way to encourage the wasps to be around besides building abandoned buildings and whatever? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I had a personal dilemma the other day because I've got a two-year-old and he has this little wooden house in the garden and, uh, and he went in his little house and I could hear this buzzing and, and a little yellow jacket had started for building a nest uh, and she was beautiful and he was delighted. He was, whoops, whoops, mummy, whoops. Um, and it was so cute. But, and I, I had a dilemma, what do I do? do, I, do I've been preaching, don't kill the wasps, leave the nest alone. But there's one in my child's, you know, Wendy house, what do I do? So I did have to remove it because, you know. Um, so I think there's a time and a place for wasps. You know, I, I don't want them where my children are playing. Absolutely. But you'll be surprised to know that you can actually relocate wasp nests. Now, and I think somebody should make some money out of that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you, you can, um, you, so what we do a lot, we've been doing a lot of in the last few years is digging up these Vespula nests, these uh, yellow jacket nests, um, and you can get the whole nest out. Um, and they get a bit angry, but it, it's fine. Um, and theoretically, you, you, could, you could relocate them. So I think, you know, we should, maybe that's a new citizen science thing we should do to get the public relocating <laughs> uh, wasps' nests. Um, but it, my answer actually is it's difficult because, you know, even... I, who uh, self-confessed lover of wasps, um, I don't want wasps where they're going to kill my uh, kill uh, sting my <laughs> <laughs> sting my children. <laughs> but I, I, it's interesting you mentioned that though, because um, in the tropics, I think there is a way in which we can encourage the wasps. Now, the tropics, um, not only where you have a lot of abandoned buildings in the in, in third world countries in particular. Um, the wasps will just move in and they will occupy these, um, these buildings. And, and that's made me think, well, you know, we could be creating wasp farms. So in the same way that in the States, we, you know, they, they move like hundreds of thousands of bee colonies across the country through the seasons to, to pollinate. They work the bees to pollinate the different crops at the different seasons. Um, I'm not suggesting we, we move wasps around, but we, should, we could certainly be creating habitats for them to move into. And it's very simple. You just need, a, in the tropics in particular, just a, a concrete structure and just leave them to it. And you can actually translocate them in there and, and seed a population. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, thank you. So we're going to take the, the last question because I've been asked to, to, to keep on time. So yes, Paul. Um, oh, it's great to see Syrian back here and, and Kate, both two X, Y, Z people. Um, but my actually uh, question is for Kate, actually. Um, the, um, I mean, this, this we, we, we've, we've all seen the, the sort of the long, you know, the IUCN red list for many years, the living planet, and this sort of long, inexorable decline in, in wildlife species and biodiversity. And, and I mean, do you, do you think that the, the kind of approach that we've had in, um, a, a, has been inadequate and, a, and has basically been failing, and we really need a kind of a different approach anyway that it brings in the latest te technology, technological innovation, and um, you know, sort of human economic development to actually fund it as well. So, um, because actually, you know, do you think this is the future conservation for really could solve every wildlife species conservation problem given time, and or or, or is that sort of too wildly optimistic? And are there going to be some wild conservation problems that are intractable to our technology, however good it gets in in decades to come? I think that was a very challenging question, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess this is one tool in our toolbox that we can start to monitor populations better and not just monitor them but manage them and I think that's that's one of the issues that we've had is that we just don't understand in enough detail 
the impacts of our specific actions on populations. So in general, we know, but you know, pollution, for example, you've done so, you've done a lot of work and leading that on PCBs, and we didn't understand those those interactions until relatively recently. So if we could have a better system of understanding our our actions in a more immediate way, we can do adaptive management, and I think that's really important. The second part is like, are we, we are losing, we're losing this battle, and we need to change tactics. And I think that my work, and Natalie said I'm a, a broad, a jack of all trades, and it's because I'm really passionate about wildlife, I'm really passionate about saving our planet, and I think the only way to convince people to do that is to link it to human health and well-being. And I'm afraid that's the only way that people will even care about it. And, I, and, I've, and I've really thought about the consequences of biodiversity loss, and that's what I've been trying to do in my research over the last few years. So I guess not just about human health and well-being, but changing our economy. So we really need to start to think about limits on our, econ our economies and not just about growth, about living in our ecological limits. And, and if you are interested in this, I, I'm not related to Kate in any way, but Kate Rayworth has written a book which has been really inspiring to me and that she's thought about uh, this new economy, uh, economics called um, donut economics. And donut, and the outside of the donut is, is ecological sustainability, that our ecological limits of our planet. And the inside of the donut is our social responsibilities to people on this planet. And we've got to live within that donut. And, you know, the normal kind of idea about economics is this rational economic man, man, and man being the operative word, uh, about making these decisions uh, about nature uh, about businesses and, and exploiting nature as, as if it's unlimited. And I think this kind of switch into donut thinking is how we need to move. And, and understanding the value of nature is going to be a key part of that. So we're going to have to stop there because uh, we overrun, as usual. <laughs> um, so thank you again for joining us for uh, those UCL uh, lunch hour talks. And thank you very, very much to both Sirian and Kate for coming here today. Thank you. Thank you.